Hi guys, we're gonna look at chapter 28. This is gonna talk all about growth and development of the school-aged child. And we're just gonna get started here. So when we look at that school-aged child, this is our six to 12 year olds. Note that that encompasses several years and that a six year old clearly won't be doing the same things as a 12 year old. So, but just be aware they kind of all, they all fit still in the school-aged child period of time. There is slower physical growth. They do have accelerated social and development growth that increases in complex complexity. The focus of their world is really expanding from family to teachers, friends, peers, and other outside influences. They also have the ability to abstractly think and they really seek approval from those peers, teachers, and parents. So as far as physical growth, um, they do grow about two and a half inches per year. This increase in height is at least one foot during this stage. Girl, this is where girls tend to surpass the boys um, in that later school aged time. As far as um, weight, they're gonna gain about seven pounds per year. Secondary sexual characteristics begin to appear um, so this is considered their prepubescence. This is that awkward two years before puberty where rapid growth in girls begins. They have a negative perception during this time, which can cause some low self-esteem. Some of those secondary sexual characteristics might be breast development, pubic hair, underarm hair, chest hair, and some acne. Organ system maturation is going to differ with age and gender in the school age period. As far as neurological system, um, their brain and skull still are slowly growing. Their cognitive processes are still maturing. Respiratory, again, that rate is still decreasing. Their respirations are now becoming more diaphragmatic versus abdominal. Cardiovascular, their blood pressure is now is still increasing and that pulse is still decreasing. Deciduous teeth are those primary teeth or baby teeth. Um, there's about 20 of them. They're losing those and replacing them with those permanent teeth. They do have fewer GI upsets. Um, their stomach increases in capacity. Um, as far as musculoskeletal, coordination and strength are increasing. Their muscles are be just becoming, are still immature, but they're slowly getting um, more mature and not as easily injured. The immune system reaches about adult level at 10 years, and they do have fewer infections that they are experiencing. As far as their motor skill development, physical activity that's gonna contribute to health for the rest of their life. So when we look at gross motor, um, this is that ability um, to ride a two-wheel bicycle, jump rope, they can dance, they can participate in a variety of sports. Myelinization of the central nervous system can refine their fine motor skills, their hand usage improves, they have, it's steadier, it's more independent with writing, printing, sewing, building, and crafting. Um, so that dexterity improves, they start using musical instruments. Um, so gross and motor skills are getting very fine tuned at this point. Sensory development, all senses are mature. Typical child has a 20-20 vision. Um, the school nurse is gonna play a really big role in this vision and hearing screening. Um, they're gonna be the ones that probably identify any concerns. As far as signs of visual problems, um, this is again where that school nurse is gonna come in and make a big play. So it could be that they're rubbing their eyes, they're squinting, they're not reading, they have frequent headaches. If you have a student that's coming into the school nurse multiple times for headaches, vision might be something you might wanna consider. Maybe they're holding their reading material really close. Um, they're having some sports related eye injuries. Um, that could just indicate some visual disturbances. 
So some of the visual problems that we've identified in this age group um, include amblopia, which is that lazy eye. So there's reduced vision in an eye that has not been adequately used. Um, so during early development, um, if we're not using that eye adequately, it could cause that lazy eye or that amblopia. It is the leading cause of visual impairment. Um, causes of amblopia are uncorrected refractory area, er, errors that might include nearsightedness, far sightedness, and astigmatism. Um, sometimes school age kiddos have misalignment of the eye or strabismus. Um, and again, we just need to make sure we're recognizing that these are visual problems and that we need to get them treated. If we leave them untreated, they could persist into adulthood and could cause some permanent visual disturbances. As far as communication and language skills, their vocabulary is expanding to eight to 14,000 words. Um, they're developing metalinguistic awareness so they can understand language and its properties. They're able to understand those double meanings um, and play on word sounds. They start to understand metaphors. So a stitch in time saves nine, a bowl in a china shop, Red Bull gives you wings, all of those metaphors that can start understanding what they mean. This age group may experiment with profanity, dirty jokes if exposed. So making sure that we're role modeling um, that's very important during this age time. Knowing the child's temperament can help care health care providers um, and parents to understand that behavior, their actions, and how they relate to the world. There are three common grouped temperaments. They include easy to uh, easy and adaptable, slow to warm up, and difficult and easily frustrated. When we think about those school age um, students that are easy to adapt, it's a smooth transition. There's not a lot of stress that's involved. Those that are slow to warm up, they may have trouble adapting. Um, they may be uncomfortable in new places and situations, and they may show some frustration. Difficult and easily frustrated, they're gonna benefit from an introduction to a new experience and people by role playing, maybe by visiting the site or being introduced. This is going to require patience, firmness, and understanding to make it that new transition easier. So how can we assess a child's temperament? We can interview the child, we can observe, we can question the child. As far as self-esteem development, um, it's going to really mirror that child's self-worth and consistent of both positive and negative qualities. As far as body image, they perceive their body. Um, they are interested in peers' views and they want to be accepted by their peers regarding their body. Lifelong effects can occur if older school age children are teased about things. When we look at fears, school aged fears, um, they shift from pretend things like monsters to real life, including natural disasters, being harmed by somebody, the death of a loved one, and then just trying to figure out coping strategies that can help alleviate some of those fears. Sometimes that could be self-talk, relaxation, deep breathing, um, things like that. When we look at peer relationships, this is going to really help influence independence from parents. They associate with peers of the same sex. Valuable lessons can be learned, including respect of different views and establishing those norms. Social influences, sorry, school influences um, help with social development, conforming to structured group activities, and the ability to join clubs. So this will be when they, you see Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, um, they're starting to join some of those clubs because of school influences. When we think about family influences, this still continues. They still continue to need their parents, but they do prefer their peers at this point. So according to our theorists, we can look at Erickson and Piaget. 
Um, according to Erickson, the school aged child is in the industry versus inferiority stage of development. Tasks become more complex. They're involved in those school activities, church activities, community activities. So satisfaction in achieving and developing those new, new skills increases that self-worth. If those expectations are set too high, incompetence may develop and they may feel inferior. The cognitive theorist Piaget states that this age group is in the concrete operational stage. So they can see things from another person's point of view. They can think through an action, they can anticipate the consequence and then they can rethink that action. They use stored memories to help evaluate current situations. Remember the physical activity um, is highly important and some of the benefits that we're gonna see with this age group is it's gonna help with cardiovascular fitness, it's gonna help with that weight control because obesity is still gonna be a concern um, remember that the there's emotional tension that can happen in the school age time frame. So it's going to help release some of that and develop some leadership and social skills. When we think about promotion of safety, car seats or car safety, remembering seat belts, back seat sitting is the best um, place for these children still. Pedestrian safety that we know that school age is more dependent. They might be walking to school to so make sure we're educating on looking both ways at crosswalks, walking on the sidewalk, watching for cars that are backing out in parking lots, so just those safety things to that nature. As far as bike safety, we have general and traffic safety. As far as general safety, remembering to wear helmets, bike trails, wearing shoes when they're riding, if they're riding their bikes within the traffic, that they're also obeying traffic signs, lights. If they're riding at night, making sure they're not wearing headphones while they're riding, um, using a spotlight, something that they can be seen if they're riding on, at their bike late at night. Sports safety need to match the ability and desire, um, right? We don't want to put a six-year-old out in maybe tackle football. So making sure that that ability matches the desire and they're using a pr appropriate protective gear. Fire safety, make sure working smoke detectors are in the home. There's a fire escape plan. They know how to call 911 and the appropriate time to call 911. Only use the stove top under adult supervision. Water safety, teaching them how to swim, using life preservers making sure they're not running around the edge of the pool, no diving unless it's indicated. And then firearm safety, um, just again, education, don't touch guns, make sure guns are safely secured in a place that's locked and never point a gun at any other person. When we're assessing nutrition, we can check height and weight compared to previous measurements, and that might include a BMI at this point, so that's that body mass index. New, what is their nutritional history? So we could talk to them about what was consumed over the last 24 hours and ask if that's a typical day of eating for that patient. We might wanna inquire about family meals and that social aspect. Are they able to eat together to talk about the day? Who helps prepare the meal? And then identify any knowledge gaps. Um, and then we can educate on those knowledge gaps. When we look at the nutritional needs of our school aged patients, we need to make sure we're considering age, gender, and activity level, because that's all going to vary. As the needed calories decrease for this age group, the appetite usually increases. So just making sure they're getting those, that calcium, that iron, and the different components um, during those different age groups. So some common developmental concerns that we can think about, um, television and video games, making sure that we're limiting that to one to two hours per day, that we're monitoring what's being watched or played. Um, by the age of 18, a child will see 200,000 acts of violence. And although school age can determine real from not real, it may still lead to some risky behaviors. Obesity, still a really huge concern for this age group. 
So making sure we're encouraging healthy eating habits, physical exercise, being a good role model, um, and never using food as a reward. School phobia, um, when to take back to school. If there's a fear, we need to investigate that fear. What is the reason? We might need to collaborate with the teacher, the school nurse, the principal, somebody. Latchkey children, um, those are the children that have to go home alone without a parent. So reminding them not to answer the door. They can't have friends in the home without a parent. I'm um, again teaching them about the fire safety. Stealing, lying, cheating, bullying, tobacco and alcohol education are all big developmental concerns at this age. Um, we need to start discussing the dangers of using tobacco and alcohol. Again, parents should be role models, and we also need to think about cigarettes and smoking. So what do we do with discipline at this age? Um, they are aware of cause and effect of their behavior, and they do realize that those behaviors have consequences. Natural consequences allows that child to learn the result of his or her action. So if you can, if they know they're gonna do something wrong, they're still gonna be safe in doing something wrong, give them that natural consequence. If they throw a toy out the window, they can no longer play with that toy, things like that. As far as logical, not putting away a toy means they don't get to play with it for the rest of the day. So um, learning those natural and logical consequences of discipline. Um, establish those rule guidelines. Preserve the child's self-esteem. Don't belittle or insult. Be consistent and be fair. Parents should also discipline with praise. Positive acknowledgement of positive behaviors are more likely to encourage those positive behaviors and promote development. So what are some factors that might determine the type and amount of discipline? We need to think about the developmental level of both the child and the parent, the severity of the misbehavior. The more severe the behavior, um, probably the greater the discipline. Establish family rules, establish the temperament of the child, and respond to the child, um, response of the child to rewards. If they respond well to rewards, then that might be a factor on how you discipline. Promoting sleep and rest. Um, these school age children need 10 to 12 hours of sleep. Um, they should have a predictable bedtime and they should have expe expectations with wake up times. They need to, is it an alarm that's gonna wake them up? Is it a phone call from mom that's gonna wake them up? There needs some be some expectations. They may need, some, may need some winding down period to promote sleep. Um, night terrors and sleepwalking may occur at this. This should be resolved by about eight to 10 years of age. When we look at cultural influences, um, nurses again must be aware of the cultural effect on children and various family structures and those traditional value. And that concludes chapter 28 on the school aged child. If you have any questions, you can shoot me an email or we can chat about it in class. Thanks guys.